Uh, welcome everyone to the annual KTC Employment Law Year in Review. A couple of very quick housekeeping matters. Bathrooms are over there, under the heading bathrooms, always a good giveaway. Um, should there be an emergency, we have the stairs you came up or else you can head out behind you, uh, out the back and turn left. And I'm not sure what happens after that, but it seems like a good way. Uh, to, to extract yourself should there be an emergency. All right, just um, very briefly, last year you'll recall, for those who attended, that all the focus was on um, COVID and fair pay agreements. And a lot can happen in a year because both those issues are now largely um, falling into obscurity, apart from something Andrew Casey may want to talk about. I'll leave that with him. Uh, and all the rage now is around AI uh, in the workplace, uh, tikanga, and what the new government, if we eventually get one, um, is going to be um, introducing into the employment law area over the next year or so. All of those topics are going to be addressed today and covered off today. The format is that we have a number of speakers. They will speak for roughly um, 10 minutes each. And as they get beyond the 10 minute mark, I'll make it very clear to them that, that they need to start speaking very, very quickly. Um, and we should um, be about an hour to an hour 15, an hour 20. We'll take questions at the very end. So if you do have any questions, just to ensure we can maintain the flow, uh, note them down or store them in your head. And uh, once we've finished with our last session, which is uh, going to address what's going to come over the next year. We'll take questions at that stage. So without further ado, I will pass you on to Anthony, who's going to talk on current workplace issues and trends. All right, well, thank you, David, and good evening, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to be talking with you uh, about this year's uh, current workplace issues and trends that we see. Uh, when we started this year, uh, most of us probably never wanted to think about COVID-19 ever again. Issues around lockdowns, vaccinations, border closures, border reopenings, we couldn't move on quickly enough. And as David's alluded to, don't worry, I don't think any of us are going to be talking more about COVID-19 this evening. But the economic effects are still with us, and they directly or indirectly give rise to many of the current issues in the workplace. We're in a high inflation, high employment environment, and that means that attracting and retaining staff is a top priority. While recent indications are that some skill shortages are improving, uh, there have been more and more issues that we've seen related to remuneration packages, bonuses, incentive payments, share schemes, bonding arrangements and allowances, particularly in terms of new or creative or innovative methods to try to incentivise employees to come in from overseas uh, or potentially from competitors. There's also been a similar noticeable increase given to restraints of trade. The enforceability of non-competition, on solicitation and non dealing uh, restraints comes up frequently as employers are under pressure to protect their business interests or, on the opposite side of the fence, to try to attract staff who may be working for the competitor. Another key issue that's getting a lot of attention is working from home. It's a controversial topic, and summarizing it in general trends is difficult because for every industry, there's a different series of benchmarks for every employer, there is a different set of expectations, and for every employee, there are their own individual set of likes and dislikes and unique circumstances. Uh, many employers, though, are generally inclined to give at least some flexibility, but there is increasing focus on the practical difficulties of how working from home can shape company culture and how it can complicate things like running a disciplinary process or running a performance process. 2023 has certainly been a year of revisiting working from home policies that may have been drafted one or two or even three years ago, 
to ensure that they are fit for purpose. There also appears to be a greater awareness of Part 6AA of the Employment Relations Act, uh, which sounds niche and is often overlooked, um, but that is a provision that gives employees the statutory right to request flexible working arrangements from their employer. And employers can only refuse such requests on specific grounds. Those sections have been around since 2008, so they're certainly not new, but it's now increasingly common to see employees falling back on those sorts of provisions, particularly when their preference is to work from home, and they are potentially trying to push back against initiatives to introduce a hybrid working model, or even where employers are trying to make working from the office compulsory. Well, it's nice to know that I've got a bit of a fanfare going on for some of these points. Let's move on, that sounds quite nice. Um, sitting behind all these types of workplace issues are some of the fundamental questions about employment law, questions like who actually is an employee? Uh, Section 6 of the Employment Relations Act sets out the meaning of employee, but who is in and who is out under that definition, and even how the section should be applied, uh, continues to be a developing area. The Employment Court in the last year or so has taken to using the metaphor of Section 6 as a gate, uh, through which workers must pass to access the promised land of all of the protections and benefits and entitlements uh, of employment. So the Employment Court as a gatekeeper, using that metaphor, has been very active, and 2023 has been another year of high-profile Section 6 cases. Uh, two that I wanted to mention were the Gloria Vale case, um, well, they received a lot of publicity, in which the employment court found that six women who were born, raised, and worked at very young ages in the Gloria Vale community were employees, not volunteers. Uh, the other big case that you all certainly be familiar with is Uber. Um, the employment court's decision that a number of Uber drivers in Wellington were employees, not contractors, uh, has been given leave to appeal to the Court of Appeal. And that may be heard as early as March next year. So it's certainly a developing issue um, and one that will continue to see some progress. Uh, in 2023, we also saw some of the highest net migration gains from refugees, with many new migrants coming in from South Asia, Southeast Asia, and Pacific. In that context, there's been a renewed focus and trend towards trying to eliminate migrant worker exploitation. Uh, back in July, the Worker Protection of Migrant and Other Employees Act was passed, which will come into force next year in January, and introduce new offence and penalties for uh, employers of temporary migrant workers trying to deter them from breaching their employment standards. Prior to the election, the government also announced an intention to try to bring New Zealand up to speed with countries like Australia and the UK in introducing modern slavery legislation. Sometimes hard to believe that those are persistent issues in the New Zealand employment law landscape, uh, but unfortunately they are. And just last week, it was reported that the Labour Inspectorate had conducted a large scale operation which had found 85 businesses were in breach of employment standards for migrant workers. Now, turning to litigation trends over the last 12 months, uh, later this evening we will be covering some of the major cases. Um, but just with big picture trends for now, I think it's fair to say that the Employment Relations Authority and the Employment Court have been kept busy. Um, I have prepared a graph as a little bit of a statistics nerd. Um, so here you can see in the top line the authority cases, the trend since 2017. You see we hit that big pothole around COVID times, and it's since climbed up steadily. Noting we've got another month to go, of course. Whereas the employment court, that line slightly below, that has been relatively consistent over the last few months. Now, when I was preparing for this, I was expecting to be able to say to you, the authority and the court have never been busier, because that is the impression that certainly feels that way. But as you'll see, based on the hard numbers, the authority and the court are busy, but possibly the substance is what's taking up so much of the time, and there are a backlog of cases they are trying to work through. Uh, particularly as a result of that uh, decline of COVID. 
in terms of the composition of cases, the vast majority are personal grievances for unjustified disadvantage and unjustified dismissal. That brings us to another important trend, which has been the significant increase in awards for tax recompensation for hurt and humiliation, uh, particularly in the authority where a personal grievance claim has been upheld. If we go back five years, back to 2017-2018, what you see here is what compensation awards in the authority used to look like. Now, I appreciate that might be a bit small to see, but Basically, each of these bars, each of these towers, is in $5,000 blocks, um, with zero to $5,000 far left, working our way up to $25,000 and above on the far right. And just by looking at that, you'll be able to tell that the most common award is somewhere in the $5,000 to $10,000 range. Um, and it gets progressively less from there to the extent that out of the 150 or so cases, only six were in the extreme highest band. I'm now going to take us forward in time to this year. So please watch carefully. I was very impressed when I figured out how to do this, and let's like do this. Um, so what you'll see is just visually, um, there has been increases. Uh, it's not as simple as saying that in the last five years we've had inflation and that has pushed out compensation award increases upwards. Uh, without a doubt, inflation has been a key factor, but there's a bit more that's going on to this picture. The total number of authority cases in which compensation has been awarded has been increasing. And since 2017, it's increased by about 50%. So roughly, we've gone from 150 cases of compensation to upwards of 200. So there are more awards of compensation and those awards are higher. To the point where the average compensation is no longer five or 10,000, it's now 15,000, 20,000. Um, these numbers are only up until June this year. Uh, as it happens, there was an employment court case in June that updated the bans for compensation. Uh, we're going to talk about that case a little bit more later tonight, but the key takeaway I think is these numbers are only going to go up, and they have been going up. Why? Uh, well, some people might say it's because employers are acting worse. I don't really think that's the case. Um, I think that what we're seeing is inflation coming through to a certain degree, but also the types of cases in which compensation is being awarded. You're seeing more and more cases where um, individual employees are represented by advocates or by uh, qualified lawyers, and a lot of that, I think, is driving up this increase. So there we are. Um, thank you very much for that everyone, and apologies for those interruptions that we had with the uh, wonderful sirens. Um, I'll now pass on to Andrew for an update on collective bargaining. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, it has been a crazy, crazy year in the world of collective bargaining. I don't know how many of you are actually involved in it, but it is a hilarious part of New Zealand employment law. Uh, and particularly over the last 24 months, it has just been completely crazy. Uh, and last year was a continuation of that trend from the year before. Uh, there are a number of things driving the, the sudden complexity involved in collective bargaining. Um, inflation obviously has had a huge impact on uh, people's expectations going into collective bargaining on employers' ability to actually afford settlements uh, and on the, the sorts of deals that are being done. Uh, also driving things up have been the minimum wage movements, and I'll come back and talk about those bits in a second. Uh, there's also just a lot more complexity in the environment generally than there, had, than there was um, five years ago and for the 20 years before that. There's a range of other processes that are kind of adding layer upon layer into the whole bargaining environment. Uh, some of you may be aware that there are a whole series of pay equity claims, uh, particularly in the health sector, uh, where nurses, for example, say that they do a job that is uh, the same value as the job of, say, a detective, and because a detective is paid X, then a nurse should be paid X. 
uh, and there are a series of those sorts of claims uh, flooding through the public sector, uh, which then has a knock-on effect into relevant parts of the private sector. There are also a number of private sector claims now being directly launched by the unions, uh, and obviously that is uh, causing people to scratch their heads quite a bit because the whole process of trying to work out whether a nurse does or doesn't do the same job as, say, a detective uh, is a curious process, to say the least. Uh, in addition to that, throughout the whole of this year, there have been a whole series of fair pay agreement processes underway, and uh, that has had an impact on the collective bargaining processes in those industries, and I'll talk a little bit about those at the end. Uh, and then I think the other thing that has just been remarkable to watch this year is how spectacularly short of resource most of the unions are. Uh, we have had collective bargaining processes where uh, it has literally been 18 months since the union was last able to provide an advocate to actually turn up the bargain with us. Now, that's an extreme example, but regularly we are waiting months for unions to actually be available to turn up the bargain. And of course, as time goes by, people's <laughs> expectations go up and the arrears claims get bigger uh, and it uh, significantly complicates the environment. Uh, the, the biggest driver of all, though, of course, has been the inflation rate. Uh, you will all have lived through versions of this problem. You will all have been to the supermarket or the petrol station over the last few years. And you will all know that uh, prior to June 2021, we've had a benign environment where for 20 years inflation has been between 0 and 3%. And then suddenly from kind of September 2021 onwards, the extra money that was being pumped into the economy had the inevitable impact and inflation went through the roof. And uh, if you're bargaining in an environment where inflation is already at kind of seven or eight, you know, seven percent, whoops, um, obviously union expectations and the expectations of those members they represent are going to be climbing dramatically. And when you're bargaining, especially if you're trying to do a two or three year deal, then you're trying to look two or three years out from now, which means you're trying to predict what the inflation rate will be in um, September 24 or September 2025. And for most of this year, it was pretty hard to predict who the government would even be. And in fact, it's still slightly, <laughs> slightly unsettling in that department, uh, but trying to, trying to predict where uh, pay rates should go over that period has been very difficult. Uh, another major factor that has been driving the cost of settlement up has been the significant movements in the minimum wage. Um, year upon year upon year, they have been going up by five, six, seven percent. And if you drive up the bottom rates by that much, then of course everybody above that also wants to go up by the same amount. Uh, generally, in my experience, that just hasn't been viable in many private sector businesses. And so there has been quite a bit of rate compression with the bottom rates going up because the legislation says they has, have to, but higher rates going up, by no, but by not as much. Uh, overall, the combined effect of the world we've been in uh, has basically been that there uh, has been more uncertainty, and so bargains have been taking longer, and they've been more complex, and they've been more difficult. Uh, generally, the terms for documents have been shorter. Uh, at least looking forward, they had only been looking forward by about one year. Often it's taken six months or 12 months to do the deal, so it's been a two-year document because six months or 12 months has already gone by. But looking forward, there's only one more year before you're back into bargaining all over again. Uh, overall, settlements have generally been way higher than they ever used to be. For, for decades, uh, the settlements were always somewhere between 1% and 3%. Uh, it is now very common to see settlements at 6 or 7% because anything below that is actually a real wage decrease. 
Uh, surprisingly, though, there have been a lot of deals done at way less than the price of inflation. Um, partly that's a reflection of the employer ability to pay. In the private sector, there are a lot of businesses that are really struggling and they simply have not been able to afford big settlements. Uh, and secondly, I think it's a reflection of how poorly understood the impact of inflation is. If, if you're offering somebody a 5% pay increase, it sounds like a lot and it looks like a lot. And so people vote yes for it, despite the fact that it's a real wage decrease. And I think that kind of lack of understanding about um, the difference between a real wage and a nominal wage uh, has been really interesting to watch. Uh, the next trend that is really noticeable is that people have given up trying to fix a figure for years two and years three of a document, and instead they're just using a formula saying that we'll pay CPI or CPI plus 1% um, because it is simply impossible to, to predict uh, whether inflation is going up or down, and if you think you know which direction it's going, then how fast do you think that's going to happen? Um, the prevailing view is that inflation is on the way down, but, but how fast that is going to happen, um, there are a huge range of views about. Uh, and then finally, we're seeing um, in an, a lot of industries like the health industry, much greater linkages between what's happening in the public sector where there are um, a whole bunch of pay equity processes and so on, uh, or just public money being handed out, handed out hand over fist. Um, the bus driving industry has been a spectacular example where uh, various regional councils have found bucket loads of extra money to shovel at bus drivers, including after the deal has already been done and just giving away extra pay increases and so on. And that kind of the impact of what the public sector is doing has been quite significant for a lot of private sector businesses. Uh, I thought I'd just finish off with a little rundown of the whole fair pay uh, fiasco. Uh, you'll remember that the Labour government introduced uh, fair pay agreements with effect from 1 December last year. There was a lot of noise from the unions that they had been waiting for seven years for this to happen and they were all ready to go and they were going to initiate the fair pay agreements and drive these processes through as fast as they could. They were aware of the potential for a government change, and so they wanted to get processes underway and finished before the election and before uh, there could be a change in the legislation. Uh, cynics and those who had been involved in the old award processes in years gone by anticipated that it was going to be way harder than they realised and take way longer than they realised. And it has now become abundantly obvious that the cynics were completely correct. Uh, there have been seven processes started, and not a single one of them is anywhere near completion. Uh, the one that's furthest ahead is the bus industry, and they have managed to have one bargaining meeting. Uh, that bargaining meeting occurred about a month ago, they were meant to be having a second meeting, but the advocate for the union was in Geneva and not available, and so it hadn't been possible to have a second meeting. They haven't yet agreed to anything at all, but they have had, at the one bargaining meeting they did have, uh, MB ran a really useful training exercise for them in good faith bargaining. Uh, and so that's how much progress they've made. And none of the other six processes have even started. Um, there is still work going on uh, in the next six down that list, POSPO, security guards, commercial cleaners, early childhood, and the grocery and supermarket process. Uh, we're in a curious position where although everybody knows the legislation will be repealed, there isn't yet a new minister, and so nobody yet has officially said that. And so uh, they, um, the processes are still sort of dragging on. Uh, and then finally, the Waterside Worker process uh, has not yet even started, although the Waterside Workers have applied for it to begin. The expectation, though, is that uh, very shortly, within a matter of days, the whole legislative framework will be repealed, and 
uh, all of the work that has been done can be put on the back burner for at least the next six years and probably the next nine years. Uh, but rest assured, next time the government changes, you can you can be sure it will come back out again and become a reality again. All right. Uh, that brings us to the interesting world of AI. Jim. Thank you, Andrew, for your um, very informative and interesting uh, presentation. Um, so, good evening, everyone. I will attempt to provide you with a brief and uh, hopefully not too technical overview of um, information te intelligence technology in uh, New Zealand businesses today and how AI can affect employer and employee relationships, as well as what challenges and developments we have to look out for in this area. Um, so, first of all, in terms of AI, um, the term artificial intelligence was, uh, well, what is it? This term was originally coined by a group of scientists about 80 years ago, and, um, and they proposed using this term to rep uh, describe the goal of creating uh, uh, machines that could replicate human intelligence, and especially computer systems that are used to process data and make sense of it or use it to predict or uh, automate tasks. Um, generally speaking, there are two types of AI. The first type of AI is what we define as a narrow or weak AI. And this is essentially all the AI processes that are available here today. Um, this type of system um, is designed to perform a specific task um, based on rules and algorithms as a guide. And this kind of system uses machine learning processes um, that are based on algorithms to um, process the data that it has obtained and information that you feed into it, which we call training data. And, um, and it produces a meaningful response that is usually analysis or a creation of, of some sort of subset of data that you have fed into it. Thankfully, that, that is all the technicalities that I'm going to be presenting to you today. Um, the next kind of um, uh, AI is called a strong or general AI. And to date, we don't have um, this kind of technology available, but it's something to look forward to in the future. And this type of strong AI is designed to think. It's designed to imagine. It's, it will be designed to be able to um, produce analysis and, and, and create meaningful cognitive responses. So that is what AI currently cannot do. It, it can't, um, and to quote uh, uh, Terminator franchise and films, Skynet is not upon us. Um, there is nothing that can um, overtake humanity, replace men, so to speak, at this point, point in time. But there has been some recent developments in um, this uh, AI platform called ChatGPT. Um, and most recently, this is something that's been um, in the media. And, and so it, it's worthwhile talking about how such systems uh, or, or such forms of narrow AI can impact the employer and employment relationship. Um, to quote, so next slide, please. Yeah. To quote um, James Manika, the, the vice president of Google's uh, technology and society, three things will happen at the creation of AI development. Some jobs will be created, some jobs will be lost, and some jobs will change. And as you can see, this is already happening in today's industry. Um, under the heading of workforce management and recruitment, um, it is approximated by a CAIPD report that 75% of HR decisions today are being made based on uh, human data. And, and this people data is, is often analyzed with the assistance of softwares that are using AI-backed technology, um, which monitor and measure the activity, behaviors, and performance of employees. And AI systems, such AI systems are already present um, in countless companies that process data concerning the provision of services by its employees, assigning and supervising tasks that give even direct instructions and evaluate the performance of these employees. Um, and, and they often are used to make decisions about transfers, relocations, career advancement, or even proposed termination of employment relationships. Um, under the heading of automation of processes, um, we are seeing un uh, under the, um, with the aid of generative AI, uh, content design and creation, as well as personalized marketing uh, technologies. Under the heading of data analysis, we are seeing that um, AI technology is being used to aid fraud detection, 
um, research, diagnosis, as well as predictive analysis and forecasting. And in terms of customer engagement, we are seeing um, numerous chatbots and virtual assistants that are replacing the function of the first point of contact with potential clients and, um, and also continue to engage the clients in order to produce um, meaningful responses to them. So the challenges that we are facing at the moment with the introduction of these AI systems, I'll introduce um, how these things impact the, the employer and the employee relationship uh, based upon these headings. In terms of data confidentiality, an example of this was seen earlier this year when Samsung software engineer got in serious trouble by divulging secret source code information. Um, because one of the functions of ChatGPT was to be able to um, max uh, maximize, optimize um, their coding um, data. And so what this engineer thought that he could do by speeding up the process was to um, put in Samsung's proprietary code into the ChatGPT network. Um, shortly following this, Samsung issued a, a memorandum to its employees um, banning the use of ChatGPT from its workplace. And, um, and, follow, and following this, um, Amazon issued a similar warning in January of this year, as well as JP Morgan Chase, and, and suits of larger US banks followed, uh, following this, um, issuing heavily restrictive AI usage policies in the workplace. Um, the short of the long here is if you do not have an AI usage policy, please get in touch with us. Um, in terms of reliability and plagiarism, most recently there was a lawyer in the US who used ChatGPT to conduct legal research and submitted um, a case and its submissions to court. Uh, unfortunately, it turned out that case was made up. Um, and so it, AI, uh, generative AI by definition, um, is based on pre-existing data that it tries to produce a helpful response based on your query. And so if there is no meaningful data, sometimes it can hallucinate these results and produce um, results that are actually non-existent. Um, and so uh, in reliance of technology such as this, it is imperative that employers monitor um, how such technology is used in the workplace so that um, you don't create things that are non-existent uh, and potentially get you into, into serious trouble. Um, in terms of copyright issues, um, various forms of generative AI are currently being used to generate and create content um, and design. But once again, um, because it is impossible to predict what outcome or what is the resulting um, data or the image or work that you're going to receive as a result of using this AI, there's no guarantee that the work that you have so-called produced is, is going to be uh, original. It could have been dis distributed to multiple other uh, inquirers with the same um, um, kind of a request. And so it is once again an issue that, that needs to be checked um, at all times. Um, in terms of privacy and ethics, this is a, a main concern for use of any generative AI-based um, systems because employees could inadvertently divulge um, private information that belongs to your clients as well as your, your company um, in, and release it into the public sphere. Um, and, and so, uh, and also, the, um, of course, breaching the, their privacy and um, obligations. Um, and in terms of discrimination, um, a well-known example of indirect discrimination um, was what happened to Amazon back in 2015, when the company realized that its new system of pre-employment um, uh, employee screen screening actually was uh, discriminating against anyone who wasn't male. Um, and, uh, and this turned out because uh, it was because that all the data that Amazon had fed into its previous successful employees based on their last 10 years of employment uh, were predominantly male. And so um, it wasn't aware until this process was found in one of their checks in that it was inadvertently and, and, um, and uh, discriminating against persons who didn't fit the description of what the data had been fed into the past 10 years. Um, and according to UK Trade Congress, uh, Union's Congress Research Report, it's also been noted that AI-powered pre-employment screening softwares in the US um, and the data that has been uh, generated by those softwares uh, are used, being used to discriminate against applicants who are more, more likely to um, become union activists. Um, and so we can see that whilst AI-based technology can greatly, greatly increase the efficiency of processing data 
and, ex and to reduce significant man hours, um, it is not prone, it is not um, absent or free from um, the chance of discrimination or discriminating against um, employees. I'll move on to the last slide. Um, the future of AI in New Zealand. So currently, there is no specific laws that regulate how AI tools operate and how organizations uh, may use them in um, recruitment or any other application in New Zealand. Um, however, um, there's a watch out for the space um, sort of thing because the New Zealand government is currently working with um, uh, the World Economic Forum to aim a uh, actionable governance framework for AI regulation. And so please watch out for this space. Um, and, uh, and with that, I am going to now pass on to Simon, who will produce uh, an update on immigration law. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. To avoid any suggestion of plagiarism, just make it clear at the outset that my slides and notes were drafted by our excellent law clerk, Mia. Um, and they weren't generated by chat GPT. Um, but I'm going to cover off three um, three main topics. Um, I'm going to look at some of the changes um, to visa categories that have occurred in the last 12 months. I'm going to consider um, some uh, employer compliance and new penalty regime. And then finally, I'm going to briefly look at nationals and election commitments um, in respect of immigration, assuming that they can conclude a coalition agreement. Uh, as many of you will be aware, last year um, the government announced a green list of 85 um, skilled shortage roles, which were designed to attract um, highly skilled migrants and to provide a pathway to residence. Um, when New Zealand is not available to fill the roles. Um, in September this year, 17 new jobs were added to the green list, including roles for engineering and automotive industry, um, corrections officers, um, helping panel beaters, um, and construction and infrastructure roles. Um, the government has also introduced a new point system for the skilled migrant and residence visa and that category reopened in um, October this year. Again, you may be aware that there was a hiatus due to COVID where that category was closed down. Um, but whereas previously um, employers of skilled migrants did not need accreditation, um, now you do have to be an accredited employer to support um, a skilled migrant category application. And in terms of the qualifying of requirements for applicants. So in addition to the health and character requirements, the English language um, requirement and the age requirement. So again, you probably know that the skilled migrant visa have to be under the age of um, 55. Applicants will now need six points um, to apply for visa. And they can be claimed by um, having a bachelor's degree or a higher level qualification or New Zealand occupational registration or a skilled job which earns at least one and a half times um, the median wage. Um, I think it's going to be difficult to qualify um, for the skilled migrant visa under the new uh, regime and Immigration New Zealand estimates that there's only going to be about 700 applicants um, um, for this category. Um, most applicants will need, I think, an offer of skilled employment in New Zealand to actually spend some time um, working for a New Zealand employer in order to qualify for residence under this category. Um, but it is possible to apply for a skilled interim migrant visa while you're working in New Zealand. But as a result of the reduced number of applications, decisions are expected to take um, less time because uh, it's no longer a cap. So previously, there was a cap, and again, you probably know there was a, there was a kind of call for selection and applicants were drawn every couple of weeks. Um, but the process and time is expected to be quicker. Um, also, been some changes to the rules for the accredited employer work visa. Um, so, from October this year, employers that wish to employ people on the accredited employer work visa can no longer rely on a 90 day trial period. So, to the extent that that applies to any in this room. Um, but again, in terms of processing time, um, job checks 
what credit info work visas um, are currently taking about six weeks uh, for those that are going through that process. Um, have some be the, there have been some kind of interesting changes in terms of penalties and non-compliance um, in the immigration area. So from January next year, um, employers are going to receive a $3,000 fine um, for each employee that they allow to work in a way that breaches any of the visa conditions. Um, so if you allow them to work in a different location um, or role, and penalties are also going to increase for minor non-compliances. Um, it's actually going to be a strict liability regime as well. So employees are going to be penalised even if they were genuinely mistaken or took reasonable steps to ensure compliance. And the current defence that we rely on, you know, having exercised the um, reasonable due diligence um, um, to avoid employing somebody unlawfully is no longer going to be available. Um, they're also introducing naming and shaming. Um, so there's going to be a published register of non-compliant employers who may be prevented from actually hiring um, migrants for certain stand-down periods um, or employers that have had their accreditation revoked or suspended. Um, in addition, at, at my daughter's school, they call it snitching in the UK, you call it grass, but there's going to be now a dedicated hotline to dobbing people in. Um, so it's an 0800 number um, has been introduced to ensure easy reporting of non-compliance. And um, about fifty million dollars of funding has been allocated to investigate allegations of violence. Um, there's also going to be increased surveillance and investigations of accredited employers. And Anthony touched a little bit of, um, in his presentation on some of the increased um, surveillance and measures and investigations that were taking place. So this is largely as a result of the increase in migrant worker exploitation that Anthony referred to. So as of October this year, there were 226 active investigations underway um, and 102 employers have had their accreditation revoked or suspended already. And in 2023, so, so this year, um, Immigration New Zealand has increased workplace site visits by 32% and the Labour Inspectorate has increased its investigations by 120%. Um, in September this year as well, Immigration New Zealand introduced again what is essentially a strict liability um, regime in respect of applicants that provide false, um, misleading or withheld information in connection with their visa applications. So um, applications are going to be declined when INZ considers that information has been misleading or concealed and intention is going to be irrelevant. So um, you run the risk that if you make a mistake, on the form that the application is just going to be um, rejected. And the consequence of this is that applicants then have to file a subsequent um, application. And because of the previous kind of rejection, they'll, they'll then need to kind of meet a character assessment or achieve a, be granted a character assessment waiver. And as part of that assessment, the character waiver, Immigration New Zealand will look at the significance of the false or misleading information um, with respect to the outcome of the application. They're also going to look at the nature and extent of um, the applicant's intentions and involvement in the provision of the false or misleading information. And then finally, they'll look at the extent to which um, the applicant exercised reasonable diligence in ensuring that they'd actually completed the application accurately. Um, now, even if applicants have previously been issued a visa before this regime um, by Immigration New Zealand in the full knowledge that in an earlier application um, they had provided misleading information, they're going to fall under this regime and so then um, their most recent visa application will need to make the character waiver assessment um, based on previous non-compliance. Um, so obviously, significant measures to cut down kind of bureaucracy and red tape. Um, um, finally, in terms of nationals, um, sorry, um, nationals commitments um, in terms of immigration. So nationals committed to changing several of the um, 
integration settings and stated that the policy um, proposes are aimed to boost economic growth and um, to remove frustrations with the system of which there are clearly many. So in respect of the accredited employer work visa, um, so they're going to relax the current added rate um, that's required for a work visa generally and re remove the median wage that's required um, to attain certain visas under the accredited employer work visa category. Um, they're also planning to scrap the median wage increase. Again, many people know that the median wage currently $29.66 per hour, and it's due to go up to $31.61 in February, um, but they've committed to scrap that. Um, they're also indicating that um, there'll be um, streamlined application processes um, and that they're going to do, achieve this by introducing priority processing fees. Um, so, um, they're also going to increase application fees generally um, uh, to make immigration more sustainable. And then just to kind of wrap up, there's going to be a number of new visa categories, so parent visa boost category. So um, under this visa category, you'll be able to get a five-year visa. Um, so you could migrate to have support yeah. parents and grandparents to come over for up to five years. And there's a couple of high-tech industry work visas as well, and um, international graduate visas um, that are Kind of capped at 500 successful applicants, which will enable a three year work, open work visa for highly educated people who graduated with a bachelor's degree um, within the last five years. And then finally, um, for international students, currently would be aware that students can work up to 20 hours a week um, under the new or under the next, uh, national introduced their proposed measures that will go up to 24. Um, a quick rattle through immigration. I'll hand over to David, who is going to look at an emerging area of Tikanga in the employment space. All right, thank you, uh, Simon, for that. I'll start with a qualification. Uh, I'm not professing to speak with knowledge in relation to Tikanga. Um, there's experts who spend their life and dedicate their lives to developing and growing their own knowledge and advising others on tikanga values. Uh, what I am going to do today is talk about the developing role of tikanga in employment law, and it's something that has been developing at a pace uh, over the last 12 months and is going to become very relevant uh, to employment uh, practices of all employers um, over the next few years. So the starting point is what is tikanga? Uh, as I say, it's something people have dedicated their lives to knowing and understanding. It has multiple meanings, it has multiple considerations. But for the purposes of what um, employment practitioners, as we all are here in the room today, need to understand is that at a basic level, it means to be correct. At tikanga Māori encompasses a system that enables individuals and groups, or the collective group in the context of, of employment, to do things in the right way, to quote someone who, who is knowledgeable in these areas. Doing the right thing for no other reason that doing the right thing is the right thing to do. And that's not a difficult concept to understand in uh, employment law because in New Zealand employment law, we all understand the concept of fairness and we all understand the concept of justification and the ability to justify uh, decisions, which is not a, a large stretch away from just the overall concept of doing the right thing in whatever situation you are in with your employees. An important um, tikanga value, particularly relevant to employment relationships, is the emphasis on mana enhancing as opposed to mana diminishing conduct. Applied to employment, that may be in the context of emphasising where possible the maintaining of employment relationships, which again is at the core of tikanga. Maintaining relationships is one of the core values of tikanga. Um, but it's also one of the core values, one of the core requirements of the duty of statutory duty of good faith. 
but the concept of um, maintaining and enhancing mana as opposed to diminishing mana is also particularly relevant in ending employment relationships as well. And I'll come to deal with those when I talk about a couple of case studies. The whole concept of tikanga Māori, uh, tikanga values really um, became prominent in the Supreme Court decision in the Crown and Alice, which I'm not going to talk about, but that's uh, been a gateway really for the courts to consider this whole concept of tikanga in relation to uh, particular areas, and in particular in specialist um, jurisdictions such as the Employment Court and other, other areas such as the, in the environmental uh, courts. The role of tikanga um, in the workplace and its importance uh, in certain workplaces where circumstances and context provide for it has been elevated by a couple of employment court judgments this year, um, which I'll come to. But importantly, what the employment court has said out of these judgments is that tikanga values sit entirely comfortably with employment law and its focus on employment relationships based on mutual obligations of good faith and the focus on maintaining and restoring employment relationships where possible. And this importance of the obligation on the employer to maintain employment relationships where possible isn't just something that, that comes out of tikanga. We've seen it in other cases this year, particularly in the redundancy uh, area, which others will be talking on today. So the one thing to take away from the session uh, today, before I look at the, the case examples, is that employment law, the, the courts clearly embrace the concept of tikanga, where the circumstances and context provide for it. And tikanga values in your workplace environment, tikanga values may, they won't always be, but may be a relevant consideration to employment related decisions, um, which could adversely impact on an employee. So what employers need to be able to do is turn their minds to tikanga in such circumstances, even if it is to rule out tikanga values as being particularly applicable to the particular uh, related employment action that is being addressed. But you need to at least have the ability to know, is tikanga potentially going to be relevant and something we need to consider in the processes and the decision making we're engaging in or is it something that is not going to be relevant uh, to the particular circumstances as an employer you may be facing? So Tikang has been applied in particular to uh, recent decisions um, this year, GF and Comptroller of NZ Customs uh, and PAC Group and Robinson. Now someone else is going to be talking about, I think Dana and Ikra are going to be talking about both of these cases. So I'm not going to deal with those cases um, in any detail outside of Tikanga how it relates to tikanga. Uh, a, one important point in these two cases is that both employers in these cases had incorporated tikanga directly into their workplace through company um, policies. Not that that's a requirement going forward to, to consider and apply tikanga if appropriate in the circumstances. But in these instances, it had been uh, part of the express policies, excuse me, uh, relevant, interestingly, because in the NZ Customs case, the employee was not Māori, um, but tikanga was seen as still being applicable because it had been incorporated into uh, company policies. This was an unjustified dismissal case, and a case where um, the court determined for many reasons that the um, employer had been unjustifiably dismissed. But a prominent reason was the failure of the employer to apply tikanga values um, to the employment process that followed uh, and ultimately terminating this individual's important, uh, employment. And in looking at the failures, what the court focused on were, um, were the importance of face-to-face -face discussions when you're engaging in action which could have an adverse consequence for the continuation of an employee's employment. So a move away from Zoom in those circumstances, anything done, uh, by Zoom or um, Teams and the relevance of face-to-face -face discussions uh, for tikanga. Um, the importance of seeking to reach con consensus. This was a no-fault termination um, and, and there was a failure by the employer to look to try and reach agreement around even how the employment relationship could terminate or whether it should terminate 
um, the, the, the rushing of the process, there was a real urgency in the way the process, uh, the court perceived the process was followed uh, by the employer. Um, ensuring the right person uh, or the right people are at the meetings you're having with the employer, with the employee, including ensuring those people who are professionally close for the employee are present. Um, designing and implementing individualised processes, so it's not a one-size-fits-all um, for everyone, uh, particularly when tikanga values come into play, and ensuring that there's minimal damage to the relationship, including post-employment. So even if the outcome is going to be uh, termination, uh, even if continuing employment is not possible, um, what are you doing to ensure um, that mana remains in task, enhanced post-employment? And that may be counselling or other such post-employment uh, factors. Um, the next case, Tax Group and Robinson, again an unjustified dismissal case. This employee was Māori, uh, was employed for 15 years as a community support worker. Um, identified alleged misconduct uh, on the part of the employee, alleged serious misconduct. During the disciplinary process, the employee raised cultural concerns around how the employer was running the disciplinary process. Uh, for example, the employer <coughs> declined the employee's request to conduct the meeting face-to-face. -face. The manager was in Central Otago. The employee was in um, Wellington. Uh, the employee wanted to meet face-to-face -face because culturally that was more important from the employee's perspective to address the issues. The employer said, no, we're going to do it by Zoom. Um, and that was a key reason why this dismissal was found to be unjustified, um, particularly because the employee had raised the, their cultural concerns around the way the employer was, was seeking to deal with the process. She expressly told the employer that the way the, the manager was looking to deal with the process at the time was stripping her of her mana, uh, was culturally disadvantaging her. She couldn't talk directly to the manager face to face in a direct and a personal way. Uh, and the impression she received from the manager was that he wasn't really listening to her and wasn't interested from the engagement across uh, Zoom. Um, the court determined that the manager, the employer, had failed to consider the concerns the employee had raised about how the process the employer chose to follow had, impact, had impacted on her mother, uh, and that the process was hurried. Again, it was a rush job, something that the courts are starting to focus on it. A lot, something to bear in mind, particularly not just in this situation, but redundancies, restructuring, uh, and the like, um, that it was conducted in an impersonal way. Again, wasn't a personalised approach to that particular individual's needs. Uh, the court determined that the um, process had undermined the employee's mana, which was inconsistent with the tikanga values, which the employer had said they were embracing in their company policies. So in that case, the the employee had won in the authority, um, the employer challenged it, and the employee's uh, remedies that they received in the authority were increased in the um, employment court. The employee ended up having her compensation award increased by seven or $8,000 to $31,000, uh, being awarded three months wages and, and being awarded um, long service leave, which she otherwise would have received um, if she hadn't been dismissed. Um, and finally, there's also a case currently for the courts, uh, which is exploring the application of tikanga in the context of whether to grant number of publication orders um, as to an employee party's name uh, being on a judgment. Um, in summary, to wrap it up, um, tikanga values, to summarise tikanga values as I've identified them, um, they focus on consensus building, they focus on respect, they focus on care, balance and um, relationship buildings. And these, these values are concepts that the court recognises sitting comfortably within the employment relationship principles um, and the application of engagement between employers and employers in the workplace. So, in summary, tikanga is one of the more important developments you need to be aware of in your day-to-day -day operational practices. It's not always going to be applicable. You need to be able to assess when it may be and when it may not be um, applicable, and it's certainly something um, to watch to see how it develops over the next uh, few years. I'll now pass you over to Dana and Ikra, who are going to be 
given you an employment case law update over the last, last year. Uh, thank you, David. And um, Ikra and I will be taking you through a um, update on the key cases for 2023. Um, and so for those of you who haven't met me, my name is Dana. And um, the first case I'll be talking about is one that David's already uh, pulled up, which is GF and the New Zealand Customs Service. Uh, this was a big case, and so I'm not going to try and attempt to summarise all of it in five minutes, but I will do my best to bring the key points to your attention. So uh, essentially, this was about an employee who worked on the border who didn't become vaccinated and as a result was dismissed from his or her employment. Uh, customs started off knowing that vaccines were imminent to arrive in New Zealand and they looked at their workforce and they decided which roles in our workforce will we target with vaccination first, bearing in mind the government wants us to get frontline workers vaccinated. And they put all of the roles who they wanted to be vaccinated first in a bucket, and they called those tier one employees. And the court looked at that and thought, well, you really should have consulted about that decision with your employees because that could impact on their employment and they had no opportunity to say, hey, I don't think I'm tier one. I sit in the back. I don't have much to do with the board. So that was kind of the first issue in the process as we moved through. And then the process continued and customs rolled out a bunch of communications to their employees about vaccination, encouraging them to become vaccinated. Uh, and the difficulty was here was really this was actually a vaccination requirement or else you might be dismissed. But those communications, at least initially, were all around educating, encouraging, supporting, as we would expect. But difficult for an employee like GF, who knew that they didn't want to be vaccinated. And so basically, ignored the communication because they weren't interested in vaccination or what customs had to say about it. And unless it was going to impact on their employment, they weren't really listening to these bulletins that were being sent around. Eventually though, it did become apparent that GF's role was on the line and that vaccination was going to be a requirement of the role. And at that point, GF you know, raised some concerns and got an advocate involved and customs said, oh no, look, we've done a risk assessment. Uh, but the court looked at the risk assessment and thought, well, I can't really see the reasoning behind how you've classified these roles as requiring vaccination. And this risk assessment is really high level and broad brush. So, you know, GF works at a certain port in the South Island that this risk assessment applies across all your ports. So it's quite a high level assessment for something that's really an individual impact. And so the court said, for risk assessment, there really needs to be close to an individualized assessment of the impact on the role. And so overall, those were the three process problems that Customs went through. Uh, the final issue was just before the meeting um, that occurred about the employee likely being dismissed because they hadn't been vaccinated. Uh, the government vaccination order, which required port, orders, port workers like this employee to be vaccinated, came into effect. And so Customs said, look, there's also this audit that requires you to become vaccinated. Uh, but of course, the employee in that meeting, again, didn't get the chance to comment and provide feedback on how Customs was thinking that this order would apply to the port worker. So again, they didn't get a chance to be consulted about Customs' decision. Ultimately, when the court looked at the series of events, they thought that there was a failure for the employer to act fairly and reasonably because there was insufficient consultation on a few steps along the way. And this fell foul of the requirement to act as a fair and reasonable employer. Court also considered whether customs actions might have not been consistent with TKANA, as David talked about, and whether customs actions might not have been consistent with additional good employer obligations applying to it as a public sector employer. But ultimately, it didn't need to decide these issues because it found that customs hadn't acted as a fair and reasonable employer, so the usual standard. Uh, another interesting comment the court made in this decision was to discuss customs actions in terms of the resources it had available to it. So it found that customs hadn't communicated responsibly with this employee throughout this process, and it noted that was despite customs being a well-resourced employer. 
And what I took away from that when I read the judgment book, it's not just about rolling out stock standard communications, but customs had the resources to be flexible when this employee raised concerns and to respond to those specific concerns, which it didn't do. And the court thought, well, you're in a good position to be able to do that. And so your duty of good faith requires you to be flexible and be communicative with your employee. Uh, the other significant aspect of this judgment, which Anthony touched on, is that the court updated the remedies bans to account for inflation. So those are the remedies bans relating to compensation for stress and emotional harm. And so previously the bans were um, based on an amount for low level harm up to $10,000, mid-level harm from $10,000 to $40,000, and then high-level emotional harm from $40,000 above, the court has adjusted those bands upwards to account for inflation. And so what that means is, in theory, if I experience the same emotional harm, I should receive more in terms of the remedies that I might get if I can tell the court that I was harmed. Another interesting point from this judgment is the court um, talked about uh, how when you consider tikanga and you consider good faith obligation, generally this is about an individualized view. Of course, when a single employee brings a grievance claim, the court's looking at this from an individualized perspective. How does customs engage with this one employee? And so there's a real emphasis throughout this judgment of looking at this through the individual lens. And so stepping back, I think there's a definite thing, as David said, of one size may not fit all as we move through these processes. And I'm now going to hand over to Ikra who talk about some other important learnings that came out of COVID-19 cases. Thank you, Dana. Um, so the first case that I'm going to be talking about is Turner and Tefatu Ora. Um, and moving along from Tikanga, this case was um, about an employee's activity on social media outside of work hours and how that became the subject of disciplinary proceedings and eventually led to her dismissal. Um, so just quickly, some of the key facts. The employee was a nurse um, at an age residential care facility. Um, so she worked a lot with elderly people um, with significant health issues. Also of relevance is the fact that this issue arose in 2021. So it was a very COVID-19 focused environment. The actual issue arose when the employee made a number of anti-vaccination posts on her personal Facebook page. Um, her Facebook page was private and she had about 80 friends on it. Um, she also made a number of racist and der uh, derogatory remarks about a particular religion and particular individuals from that religion. Um, and she also made comments about how she didn't agree with the Maori vaccine plan. Um, the employer became concerned after several staff members complained. Um, and they launched an investigation because some of the staff members were questioning whether they should be vaccinated. Um, and they were also concerned about the level of professionalism and what sort of influence a registered nurse would have on elderly people that she looks after. So the investigation was launched. She was provided um, plenty of opportunities to give explanations or provide comments, um, which she did but it was clear that she did not appreciate why the DHB had issues with her actions. I mean, the court actually took that into account um, when holding that her dismissal was justified. They said they couldn't find anything that would mitigate her actions um, during those meetings that she had where she could provide explanations. What she did say was that it was a breach of her privacy to A, get screenshots of her personal Facebook page, um, and for this to be the subject of a disciplinary process. Um, she also cited Section 13 and 14 of the New Zealand Bill of Rights Act to assert her rights to freedom of expression. Um, ultimately, she was dismissed. This was, of course, challenged, but the employment court upheld that the dismissal was justified. And I'm just going to talk about the key takeaways from that judgment that I think are quite interesting. So firstly, the court held that just because those comments were made on Facebook outside of work hours, that doesn't prevent an employer from um, launching a disciplinary process as a result of them. Um, and its reasoning was that if posts negatively impact the employer by bringing it into disrepute, or if it somehow um, harms the trust and confidence the employer has in the employee, then those out-of-work actions 
can in fact be subject to disciplinary proceedings. Um, and in this case, it was relevant because the DHB was rolling out the COVID-19 vaccine policy and you have an employee criticising that um, and, you know, posting anti-vaccine posts on Facebook. Um, and she was also not holding the standards of professionalism that was expected of a nurse. Um, furthermore, the court didn't dwell too much on the breach of privacy other than to say, no, the employee was perfectly entitled to um, investigate these concerns. There was nothing wrong with attaining her screenshots from her um, Facebook page. Um, and interestingly, the court found it useful to refer to the code of conduct policies the DHB had. So those policies um, firstly said that nurses are not to impose their political or religious beliefs on anyone else. And secondly, specifically relating to social media, they said um, nurses are expected to maintain a high standard of professionalism, and that includes on social media. So the court used that and found that to be helpful in saying that, well, the employee should have been aware that her conduct outside of work hours could be the subject of a disciplinary proceeding. Um, so yeah, it was upheld that the dismissal was justified and probably a good reminder that um, maybe perhaps policies that deal with employers' social media expectations and that can be useful um, throughout these sorts of procedures. Um, I'll now hand back to Dana. Thank you. Um, and so the next case I'm going to just, uh, discuss is a more recent decision that came out this month. Um, it, it is a classic case of a mixed motive redundancy. Um, essentially, the events occurred over a summer. Uh, we start in December at a staff drinks where Mr Pine is discussing Brexit with his um, colleagues and makes an offensive comment. The court didn't give us the gossip on what exactly he said. Uh, but it was um, offensive enough that the colleague that had the comment said to them or heard the comment went and complained to Mr Pine's manager. Uh, Mr Pine's manager sat down with Mr Pine, they had a discussion. Mr Pine goes and apologises for his comments to the offended employee who forgives him and then HR does a check-in process and by the time they've come back from Christmas break in about mid-January, Mr Pine understood the whole Brexit comment thing was something that was in the past and had been dealt with. But also something that had started in December, which wasn't related, is that the company had commissioned a workplace cultures report uh, to be undertaken about the Auckland office where Mr Pine worked. Eventually that report was finished in the new year and it was circulated just to management. Uh, and in that report, there was a write-up about um, Brexit incident but the write-up didn't include that there'd been apology and that HR had checked in, so it was quite critical of Mr Pine. Then shortly after, the company put forward a restructure proposal, and initially the restructure proposal related to one side of the business and Mr Pine was on the other side of the business and wasn't going to be affected by the restructure. But then, in a series of quite damning emails that came to light in front of the authority and the board, uh, management had a discussion about Mr Pine and he was referred to as being a people problem and someone who wasn't in the right role. And so they thought about maybe they'd do a performance process but then <clears throat> fearing a legal claim they decided, oh no, why don't we tweak the restructure that we're rolling out. And so sure enough, the restructure proposal now addressed this side of the business where Mr Pine was working. And it should come as no surprise after the restructure um, was rolled out that Mr Pine was dismissed um, by way of redundancy. Um, and the company said a genuine redundancy for genuine business reasons, but Mr Pine was suspicious and brought a claim in the authority, uh, and then that was appealed to the employment court. Uh, he was successful in both the authority and the court, who both agreed this was a classic case of a mixed motive redundancy and his dismissal was unjustified. However, where they differed was in terms of remedies. And at the authority, Mr. Pine was awarded about $8,000 of Section 1 to 3 emotional harm. So that's band one, low harm. And he was awarded three months lost wages. And then importantly, the authority said, we're not going to order penalties because no further penalty is necessary. The court, in reviewing that decision, thought, well, actually, Penalties and compensation are very different things which serve very different purposes. Compensation compensates me for the wages that I've lost as a result of being dismissed. 
um, or for the stress that I've suffered. But a penalty is there to punish my employer and to discourage employers from doing the same thing. Now, just because an unsuccessful employer might have to pay all of those three things, the only aspect of it that the court considers to be punitive as opposed to compensatory is the penalties regime. And so the court pointed out that when you blur the line between compensation and penalties, we risk diluting, the court said, the penalties provisions that Parliament notably strengthened. And so I think the judgment is a timely reminder to the authority and to practitioners and to employers that penalties and compensation, although the employer has to pay them all if they're unsuccessful, serve different purposes. And I think going forward, if I was to draft submissions for any of the partners of why we think a penalty should be awarded, this would be the first case that I would refer to. And finally, the court also clarified the threshold for when a penalty might be awarded. Uh, in previous judgments, there had become a bit of a catchphrase thrown around that it required egregious bad faith. And the court said, well, that's, that's not the test. The test is exactly what's in the statute, which is relevantly whether the conduct is serious, deliberate, and sustained and where it is intended to undermine the employment relationship. Uh, in practice, that means any sort of process where you're deliberately trying to exit an employee without a justifiable reason, probably is worthy of a penalty under that test. Um, so this is just an important reminder of how the penalties regime works. Um, and I think the court is was very clear in its decision um, about penalties and their purpose. I would not be surprised to see it referred to in further decisions for the court. And I'll pass back to Oprah for some more interesting updates. Um, speaking of timely reminders and restructuring, I'll be talking about New Zealand Steel and Haddad, um, which is an important um, decision discussing redundancy and restructuring. Um, and it's a good reminder of the sorts of expectations the courts um, have of employers who are undertaking this process. So just quickly, some of the key facts. The employee worked at New Zealand Steel um, and he was made redundant following a restructure process. Um, and there were several flaws um, with the restructuring, but I'll just name some of the more significant ones. Um, one was that the employer failed to consult him from the outset of the proposed disestablishment of his role. Um, the employer also notably failed to be responsive to the employee's queries, so failed to be responsive and communicative. Um, and an example of that is the employee indicated his interest um, for roles outside of his department, um, but the employer, aside from sending the holding response, did not respond to the employee until after the roles had been filled. Um, and so it was clearly not communicating very well. And um, the employer also failed to exhaust all redeployment opportunities. Um, and as a result of all of these flaws, the court upheld that the disestablishment was predetermined as the consultation process was flawed. Um, and it also concluded that the redundancy process was unfair and that his dismissal was unjustified. Now, there are a number of um, key takeaways from this case, which are a good reminder of the expectations courts have of employers. Um, firstly, employers need to follow a fair and reasonable process, um, and this is achieved by being active and constructive in trying to maintain the employment relationship. Um, so that means being responsive and communicative. So if employees are inquiring about roles, responding to them or keeping them in the loop of what's going on. Um, employers must also actively consider redeployment opportunities if they are considering dismissing the employee due to the redundancy. Um, and they're also expected to consult with them regularly during the decision-making process. And notably, the court commented that where these redeployment ob obligations were breached, the entirety of the redundancy process will be called into question. Um, and I think another additional point of interest was, in this case, the employee um, did not attend three um, interviews for management positions, um, but he said that because he felt that the decision had already been made to not give him these roles and felt that the exercise would be futile and humiliating. And whilst the court acknowledged his sentiments, it did comment that it was a high-risk strategy to not attend the interviews 
and that perhaps employees should consider reporting their concerns and attending the interview on a without prejudice basis so as to put the employer to the test. Um, and so that was quite interesting. And just moving on to my final case, Pat Group and Robinson, which was clearly a very interesting case. So we're going to be talking about it again. Um, but just notably, it was, um, I'm just going to briefly touch on the key findings of this case. Obviously, Tikanga was incorporated, uh, incorporated into the policies, um, but the employer didn't really take that into account, despite the employee um, bringing it up time and time again. And I believe she also said that she felt like her mana was being stripped as a result of the employer's handling of this process. Um, and so the employment court had no trouble holding that a fair and reasonable employer would engage with an employee on points of express cultural um, needs and that a failure to do so was not reasonable. Um, and as David said before, employers have an obligation to um, maintain rather than undermine mana. And following GF, um, she was awarded, amongst other things, 31000 as compensation for the effects the process had on her mana. That is this. That is it from us. And now we will pass it on to Peter. Thank you very much, Ikra and Dana. Um, I'm keeping you away from uh, drinks and conviviality. And I'm lucky in inverted commas, my part's been dramatically reduced because when we planned this, we were absolutely sure we would have a yeah, government and a minister. So um, I've done as best I can checking uh, today and most recently with Business New Zealand. At the Business New Zealand conference a month ago, they surveyed all large employers and then they had their push list and they produced this um, during the election campaign is what their um, wish list was. Andrew has mentioned the FDA, so I won't deal with that. The 90-day trials were surprisingly number two on the list. And uh, just reminding you, that's the ability of a business to employ people on a trial period. Um, Adrian Barwick here for an employment lawyer from Sydney. It's slightly confusing because in Australia they call them probation periods, but we call them trial periods, even though we can have a probation period um, here. And 90% um, of all New Zealand businesses are less than 20 people. And that's why it's so important. And actually, the CTU and the trade unions are not too worried about the reintroduction of the trial periods because their members are in large employers. So um, I note it was on the 100-day plan. I think that uh, you can expect to see that back. The apprenticeship boost um, was a big feedback from New Zealand business, and I think that that's because of the skill shortage. And I would be very surprised if that um, uh, doesn't come in. And Simon has very um, well uh, explained the possible immigration settings and changes. So I won't repeat um, that. So the policy changes I've uh, mentioned in the first two slides about the 90-day trials and the abolition of the FDAs. I think one area that you will see some change, but it's actually quite um, difficult, is the definition of an employee. If you had said to me when I started um, employment law, do you ever think that there'll be court cases as to who is an employee and who is a contractor, and who's a volunteer and who's not a volunteer? I'd say, no, you're dreaming. It's all uh, very simple. Well, it's um, ironic that um, in the employment court last year, there were 22 cases involving debates as who's an independent contractor, who is an employee. And I see John Wood uh, down in the back of the room from 
MB and mediator, John, all mediations are confidential, but I'm sure you had many mediations as people say, well, hang on, no, I'm not an independent contractor, I'm actually uh, an employee. Uh, Uber case, as um, Anthony mentioned, that is in the Court of Appeal 23-24 March next year. Uh, Business New Zealand has intervenor status and uh, our firm is appearing on that. There'll probably be some tinkering on that definition of who is an employer, who is an employee. From the Parliament's point of view, if you're having to have court cases, then it probably is a, a need to have some kind of um, a tweaking on that, although I suspect in the scheme of things, those um, are not urgent. The um, Fair Pay Abolition is on the 100-day plan, but the other ones um, uh, are not. Um, I now want to turn to the um, member bills that were in the last parliament. The constitutional law principle is that each parliament is sovereign, and when uh, parliament is prorogued or the Governor General dissolves parliament, that's it for that parliament. And it's amazing the number of articles that I've seen and read where commentators and people talk about uh, bills that are uh, still before parliament. That's not right. When the 53rd parliament was prorogued, that's it. But it is possible for the 54th parliament, when it gets to together, for the minister or anyone else to put a special motion before parliament uh, and to say, we would like, and I use colloquial expression, resurrect the following um, member bills. I'll just touch on them. I think it's unlikely uh, that four of them will go further. But what am I talking about? Um, the MP, well, the then MP for Wellington um, Central, Abraham uh, Omea, he had a member's bill called the Crime Set by Employer Amendment Bill. This, this arose out of largely new migrant employers um, essentially not paying people taking their passports. Uh, and so that's what that legislation was designed for. There is existing penalties and compliance that the Labor Inspectorate is involved in. I'd be surprised if that uh, was resurrected. As I said, anything that is there, it doesn't. The interesting one um, relating to Kiwi Saver which um, wants to have a prohibition of employers discriminating against KiwiSafe members. Again, I'd be surprised if that came in. Um, Helen White, who was MP, and still is MP for Mount Albert, she brought in a private member's bill that sought to prohibit restraints of trade uh, for employment agreements that were um, less than three times the minimum wage, so about $150,000. Kylie it came in the time of the TOVA legislation, restraints of uh, TOVA litigation. The restraints of trade were um, very much uh, on the agenda then because a lot of commentators said restraints of trade were unenforceable, don't worry about them. But there were about three or four cases where restraints of trade were uh, enforced. Could come in again, it's unlikely, though I would think. Then there was uh, Nicola Willis's bill about having greater flexibility for parental leave for either partner. Um, be interesting to see whether that comes in again or not. Um, uh, I, I don't know uh, about that one uh, at all. The last one that I want to mention, which uh, I found Andrew's comment on the minimum wage um, interesting, uh, and it was a 7% fee 
figure that um, stuck out for me. At the moment, there's utterly no science for the minimum wage or the fair fair wage. Uh, what was it called? Fair um, living wage. It, it, it's just made up. It's just politics. So the minimum wage, the minister just decides without any feedback from Business New Zealand or the CTU or the business community, we'll just increase the minimum wage. So there is talk that, um, and as I've said on Business New Zealand wish list, that there is some science to it because it has that flow through the economy that um, um, Andrew mentioned. Uh, one of the interesting act policies, uh, and, and I think everybody is interested from a selfish point of view, is January the 2nd. Um, one of the policies, whether or not it has any traction, we will see is, well, if Matariki is a new holiday and you want to keep it at 11, then January the 2nd, January the 2nd should be removed to compensate for it. Will that happen or not? I don't know. The uh, final act one that I thought was interesting was a direction, and it's the policy that all ERA decisions are to be delivered within a month of the authority hearing. That sounds great. In fact, 90% of all authority decisions are delivered within three months. It was 91% in 2021, 88% in 2022. Um, the odd case goes longer than that, but whether or not um, that policy comes in uh, as well, we'll have to wait and see. So, as David um, said, um, we will take some questions. I'm slightly conscious of the time. Everyone's been extremely polite and no one has left, um, but uh, we have gone on slightly longer than uh, anticipated or planned, and uh, that, that doesn't matter. It's now after seven. So if anyone wants to uh, ask a question or a comment, uh, they're welcome to do so. But my only question, though, would be to keep it crisp. Is there anyone who would like to ask a question or comment? I didn't think so. So um, uh, my EQ radar is... Uh, uh, alive and, and I'm watching. But look, everybody um, uh, is here. You're welcome to ask any of the speakers in our team, which I'd like to acknowledge and thank them. I thought they all did really well. I learned a few things myself. So that was um, really great. And then you've got a, a top group of HR practitioners um, here tonight, people far more experienced than us who work in the um, real world. So uh, you've got a commonality uh, connection with our firm and we're really grateful for your support and your business. We don't take you for granted and we're at the size now. I think you've seen we've got some really good expertise in the team with Simon and his immigration presentation that uh, with David's great modesty about tikanga, uh, I think he was being very modest and Andrew who probably is uh, New Zealand's top practitioner by far in collective bargaining. So uh, hopefully we've got the mix of skills um, here. So um, I invite you to have a drink and uh, to speak to the rest of the team. And thank you very much for 